Today, I'd like to introduce Derek Blue. He is an assistant professor at Harvard University or Harvard Medical School and located at McLean Hospital. Um, I have to say Belmont, Massachusetts is, is an extremely beautiful area. So he's lucky from that standpoint. Um, Derek graduated with his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where he worked with um, Erwin Lucky on the role of adult neurogenesis and neuropsychiatric disorders such as depression, which may have influenced his decision to work with, um, to, join, to join Joe Coyle's laboratory in Harvard in 2008 as a postdoctoral fellow. Now, Joe is a renowned scientist that is known for his work on neurobiology of mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. And Joe told me one time how important Eric was in pioneering many of the novel concepts in the DCR field that they had produced together. Over the past 12 years, Harvard must also realize that they had an exceptional scientist since his career blossomed there. Um, he grew through the ranks and he's currently up for promotion. And during his time at Harvard, Derek has published 36 peer reviewed articles. Um, many of these manuscripts examine the role of NMDA receptors and or d in a variety of diseases and disorders such as schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. More recently, Derek has entered into the TBI field as a collaborator of mine, where he was instrumental in obtaining our joint NIH R01 and publishing some of our work in top tier journals. So today, I believe Derek will talk about um, the role of d uh, released from reactive microglia and the implications of both TBI as well as Alzheimer's disease. So Derek, welcome. Great, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the... Uh... The kind words. Uh, thanks to everybody for uh, clicking in <laughs> to this uh, virtual seminar. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking uh, mostly about uh, <clears throat> some of the more recent work we've been doing um, with uh, DCRN from reactive glia um, in both uh, traumatic brain injury and um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, before I get started um, into that, I was it's good to give everyone a little bit of background about serine racemase and deserine, uh, just to get everyone on um, on the same page. So deserine, it's it, it's an amino acid. Um, it, it's the primary coagonist um, at four brain um, NMDA receptors. Um, and what makes NMDA receptors unique um, is that in addition to uh, the agonist glutamate uh, binding, there also has to be um, a coagonist bound um, to this subunit here um, in order for the uh, in order for the channel to open. So where does d serine come from? Uh, so d serine it, it's um, it's racemized from um, l serine by this enzyme um, serine racemase. Um, so the so in the brain you get uh, the glucose uh, comes in from the blood. Um, and then there's this rate, li rate limiting step here um, by PHGDH, um, which then uh, eventually two reactions later gets you to um, L-serine. And then as I, as I mentioned before, L-serine is then racemized um, to D-serine uh, by serine racemase. So uh, S, which I'll, I'll just refer to it as SR. Um, so SR, it's expressed um, in the same regions as, as NMDA receptors are expressed. Um, and the L-serine uh, that's used as a substrate, um, it turns out that that's actually um, synthesized in the brain. Um, so it's not from peripheral sources, it's, it's from central sources. Um, and, and the PHGDH is, is specifically found um, in astrocytes. So this here is uh, from one of the original uh, papers from the Japanese group who had generated um, serine racemase knockout mice um, as well. And, and this here just shows um, the expression of serine racemase um, with uh, postnatal uh, post development. So at P7, it, it, it's low, but then by uh, P28, you're, you're reaching almost maximal, uh, maximal protein expression. And, and you see it's primarily expressed um, in four brain regions. Um, more recently, uh, my postdoc, Timmy, uh, wanted to, to go into a little bit more detail uh, with examining the postnatal um, expression of serine racemase and, and looking at it uh, more, more closely. Um, so this is just from CA1 hippocampus. 
Um, and you can see it, it's it, it's low <clears throat> as as shown here. It's low at P8, but then uh, it, it does come on, um, come on come on board later. Um, and it's not shown here, but it's interesting. There there are some differences as as you go, but let's say between dorsal and uh, ventral hippocampus. And this is just some quantification here um, from CA1 uh, pyramidal cells. And then we also looked in other uh, limbic brain regions uh, implicated in neuropsychiatric, neuropsychiatric disorders, and you see this similar. Uh, similar uh, profile of postnatal uh, SR expression. So these are just a couple of different nuclei um, within the amygdala. So these these are some of our early work showing um, that in fact um is expressed in neurons. So this is uh, for, from that uh, from from the paper from uh, Sashi Mori's group. Uh, using serenoisomase knockouts as controls for, for antibody staining. And you can see uh, neuronal expression there in cortex. Um, this is some um, uh, just some unpublished data. This is showing mRNA, so using RNA scope with the serenoisomase with the red dots and, and the green dot. The, uh, the green cells here are a GAT67, so inhibitory neurons. So this is just showing that Serenoisomase is expressed not only in excitatory cells, but also inhibitory uh, neurons as well. Um, and, and same here with striatum, which is, uh, you know, inhibitory neurons. You can see, you know, strong expression um, there. So we also wanted to extend um, these findings to, to see if the same pattern holds true um, in human and human brain as well. So this is what from our initial publication, this is looking in a primary motor cortex. Um, and you can see these, um, these magenta cells here are, are parvalbumin positive, so inhibitory neurons. Um, and you can see uh, serine racemase is expressed um, in those cells as well. Um, this is from amygdala. You can see, um, you know, very strong expression of, of serine racemase there. Uh, the magenta is GFAP, and you can see that um, that we don't see any serine racemase expression um, in these GFAP positive astrocytes. Um, and then the, <clears throat> this is uh, hippocampus again, just showing these are excitatory cells. And you can see um, again, serine racemase in uh, parvalbumin positive cells there. So the, the neuronal expression of serine racemase is you know, conserved in humans. And, and you also do see um, it expressed both in, in, in excitatory um, and, and inhibitory cells as well. So in addition to, to using, uh, looking at these markers, we also wanted to look at uh, the functional, um, the functional source uh, of D-serine. So if you knock it out, uh, because I, I, originally serine racemase was thought to be um, a, a glial transmitter and primarily expressed, expressed in astrocytes. Um, so in order to, to functionally get at that, uh, Joe's lab had developed um, conditional uh, serine racemase knockouts in order to really test that question of if, if you knock out serine racemase in neurons or if you knock out on astrocytes, um, what's the functional, functional consequence of that? Um, so they had generated these serine racemase animals that have a flox allele um, around the first uh, coding axon of serine racemase. So you can uh, if you cross these animals with uh, mice that express Krieger combination, different cell types, you can then eliminate serine, re serine racemase in particular um, cell populations. So, so this here is with the CAM kinase uh, Cree, so you, you knock it out from excitatory cells, um, excitatory neurons um, that starts probably it starts expressing around eight or 12 weeks. And you can see you get this robust uh, decrease in serine racemase protein. Um, but if we knock if you knock it out of astrocytes, you don't uh, using a GFAP uh, tamoxifen inducible Cree, you don't see any changes in, in, in serine racemase expression. Um, and then a, a Japanese graduate student um, that was working with Joe and I um, had created um, some GAD65. Um, specific serine racemase knockouts. So crossing them with this GAD65 Cree, um, and, and this is looking in striatum, and you can see um, it's almost totally, uh, totally <clears throat> eliminated there from from cells in the striatum. So then looking at um, electrophysiologically to look at um, 
NMDA receptor function if you knock it out um, using these different uh, Cree lines. And you can see here uh, with the astrocyte knockout, you have no effect um, on NMDA receptor dependent long-term potentiation. This is in CA3, CA1. Um, but if you have the neuronal knockout, so the chem kinase Cree, you can see um, you can see the, the reduction in, in LTP. So this is in vitro. Um, and then um, paper that, uh, from Manny um, in Dan's lab, uh, they were looking at uh, in vivo um, LTP, uh, at, again, at the CA3, um, CA1 synapses. And similar to what we saw in vitro, the uh, astrocyte SR knockouts in the blue, blue squares are have normal LTP, but the neuronal um, knockouts, again, do not. So again, uh, you know, showing the, the, the functional significance of the d release from neurons is, is really what's driving uh, plasticity. Um, and this is some other work I had done looking at um, using Golgi standing to look at uh, dendritic spines. Um, again, with the neuronal uh, knockout, we're seeing uh, reductions in, in spine density similar to what we see. Uh, with the constitutive uh, SR knockout. So with, with, with all this data, uh, Joe, Herman, and I had, had uh, Herman Wallisker, who was the one who, who real, originally um, cloned this urinary uh, genes and mammal, uh, genes and mammals, uh, came up with this um, serine shuttle hypothesis, which is um, L-serine, uh, is is generated uh, in the astrocyte because they have the, they're the only cells that express this PHDGH um, enzyme. Uh, the L-serine is then shuttled um, to neurons uh, where that express serine racemase and generate the D-serine that's then used um, to activate NMDA receptors. Um, and Herman had you know, showing the importance of, of PHDDH um, in one of his recent papers, where if, if you block um, if you block PHDDH pharmacologically, um, you're able to uh, reduce NMDA receptor function and 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 block LTP. So really, you know, highlighting the importance of of the serine shuttle and and you know astrocytes being important for you know providing the um, the substrate L-serine for, for the neurons to, to ge then generate the D-serine. So what I'll talk about today is, is just, uh, before I get into the glial work, is just some, uh, some exciting results more recently that we, that we just published showing, um, showing where D-serine is coming from uh, to regulate NMDA receptor function because, you know, you know, we now know that it's, you know, under physiological, physiological conditions, it's coming, uh, serine racemase is, is, is producing D-serine from neurons, but still wasn't sure, you know, is it presynaptic, is it, is it postsynaptic? Um, so we, we started, um, we, we collaborated with someone at, at UC Davis to start to get at that question. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, D-serine is, is the primary NMDA receptor coagonist in the adult forebrain because there's also uh, glycine. Uh, glycine is the other um, amino acid that can serve as coagonist uh, for the NMDA receptor. Um, but but D-serine is, is really the, is the primary one at, at, what, at, the, um, at synapses that have been studied so far. Um, so this is showing CA3, CA1, this is dente gyrus. Again, the knockout um, has impaired, um, impaired LTP. Um, these are, these are uh, some papers from some other groups showing, um, showing similar findings um, in hippocampus, um, in amygdala. Uh, we, we collaborated with uh, Vadim Bolshakov, uh, electrophysiologist at McLean, and again showing uh, you know, reduced LTP and uh, serine racemase uh, knockout animals at, uh, at this amygdala uh, synapse. Uh, other groups have looked in uh, striatum to again show uh, D serine as the primary coagonist there. So, the, so what we sh showed recently was where is 
um, sear and racemase um, expressed in the neurons. Uh, so this is uh, so this is uh, CA1 here, dorsal um, CA1, and and you can see high expression in the cell body. But then when you you look more closely, you see this very strong um, dendritic uh, localization um, of sear and racemase here um, in magenta, and the MAP2 is a uh, marker of microtubules. So then we also performed. Um, uh, immunoelectron microscopy um, in, in the stratum radiatum region um, to see if, you know, just to confirm what we're seeing and, you, and what, what in the cyan here are, um, are, are cross sections of, of microtubules. And you, you can see very strong uh, serine racemase uh, DAB immunoreactivity um, in, those, um, in those dendrites. So then we also wanted to see, you know, they're in the dendrites, but is serine racemase also present um, in spines? So in the in the postsynaptic density. So again, uh, we, we turn to uh, immuno uh, electron microscopy, and you can see here uh, with these arrows where you have the very strong um, serine racemase reactivity in in, in the postsynaptic side, um, but no immunoreactivity. Um, on the presynaptic side, and this is just uh, quantification, ju just showing that the specificity of, um, of of the signal compared to to no primary antibody. Um, and this is uh, some confocal images looking at serine racemase with um, PSD ninety five, which is heavily uh, protein heavily enriched um, in the postsynaptic density. So this is further conform, uh, you know, further confirming that it's a postsynaptic rather than a presynaptic lo localization of the enzyme. So then we, so that was the enzyme. So then we wanted to see if we could um, detect uh, the amino acid D-serine um, in these same, uh, in these same compartments. Uh, so this is a uh, nanogold uh, electron microscopy that we did. And this is, you know, using protocols we optimized to prevent cross reactivity with um, L-serine, uh, which, which can happen if you if you don't have uh, if you don't have the right conditions. So with that optimized protocol, we we again see um, these nanogold particles. This is a cross section uh, of a dendrite here. Um, so so we do see uh, do see D-serine staining in dendrites, um, and this these are uh, synapses here again in, in stratum. Uh, we we're focusing on, on, in on stratum radiatum um, of CA1. And the, the cyan is, is the postsynaptic side and, and the yellow um, is the presynaptic side. And you can see this is just no primary antibody. You know, we don't see any nonspecific uh, labeling uh, of the nanogold particles. Uh, but when you have uh, the D-serine DC antibody, you see here uh, the D-serine staining uh, the D-serine uh, nanogold particles there. So again, demonstrating that the, both the enzyme um, and the amino acid are located um, in postsynaptic compartments, but not in the presynaptic terminals. So at this point, we, we, we collaborated with um, electrophysiologists at, at UC Davis, um, John Gray, um, to look at <clears throat> to see if we can get a functional uh, consequences of a postsynaptic um, D serine elimination. So we used the same serine racemase floxed animals that I uh, that I mentioned before. And what John's John's lab does is they they do the sparse um, the sparse transduction to give you a, a single cell genetic deletion approach. So they injected an AEV Cree. Um, into the CA1 uh, of floxed animals uh, at P0 or P1 to give you this sparse transduction here. So these these green cells are um, are neurons that lack um, serine racemase, and with this sparse method, you can then uh, record um, from a transduced cell that's lack serine racemase from a non-transduced cell that does have um, serine racemase. 
And what you can see, is, see here is that transduce cells, and then you can stimulate here from CA, <clears throat> CA3 and then record from these neurons in CA1. And you can see here that the uh, cre the, the cre positive cells that um, lacks your enrasomase um, have lower uh, NMDA receptor uh, currents. So, so demonstrating that it's a postsynaptic um, effect. And then if you look at um, if you look at LTP um, in these animals, um, you can see a reduction um, of LTP here. You don't get LTP in the cells that uh, that lack serine racemase and lack D-serine. And then if you wash on um, D-serine, you're able to uh, rescue this de deficit, showing that it is um, a D-serine uh, dependent effect. So all altogether, it, it really provides uh, nice evidence that uh, serine racemase and D-serine are working um, postsynaptically. And it seems to be that it's this autocrine mode uh, of action uh, where D-serine uh, regulates, uh, is released from the spines that actually have uh, the NMDA receptors to regulate their activity. So this was all um, under physiological conditions, um, you know, what happens in, in, in pathology. Um, so I, I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, you know, serine racemase was, was originally thought to be um, Expressed, expressed by astrocytes, and then D-serine was reduced by, by these astrocytes to regulate uh, NMDA receptor function on neurons. Um, but it turns out <clears throat> that a lot of that early data was using cultured um, astrocytes, uh, which we, using older methods for culturing astrocytes. And what we now know is that astrocytes and culture, um, you know, culturing, culturing them in those methods actually they, they produce more of a reactive um, phenotype and are not really representative of quiescent astrocytes or non-reactive astrocytes um, in vivo. So this is some work that uh, Joe's postdoc had done a few years ago, <clears throat> a few years ago now, uh, just kind of recapitulating what was you know published early on uh, by culturing uh, astrocytes um, ex vivo, <clears throat> taking, you know, taking astrocytes um, from embryonic brain and then culturing them uh, in, in vitro. And you can see that as, as they, um, as they're in culture longer, the serine racemase mRNA goes up, serine racemase protein goes up, and the slipocalin too is, has been used as a, as a marker of astrocyte reactivity. So you can see that the reactivity, you know, based on that marker um, goes up as well. So here, this is just the cartoon I had before, but now you have this um, reactive astrocyte here that now in response to pathology, the, the phenotype changes um, and now they um, express serine racemase and can actually produce um, D-serine themselves that can then be, um, that, that can then be released um, to activate NMDA receptors. So, you know, around this time, Dan had reached out, you know, to, to Joe to, you know, to, to look at the role of astroglial um, D-serine in, in response to, tra to traumatic brain injury. And we were like, well, you can look, I don't know, <laughs> you know, we don't know if we're going to, you know, we don't know if we're going to see anything, but, you know, sure, let's, let's, let's take a look, you know, because based on our physiological finding under physiological conditions, you know, the astroglial D-serine um, isn't really doing anything. So, it turns out, you know, that it really, this really turned out to be a fruitful collaboration, um, you know, based on based on the ability of these reactive astrocytes um, to produce SR. So I don't, I don't really need to tell you guys this, but you know, tra traumatic brain injury affects about 2.5 million people, huge um, economic burden um, in the U.S. Um, it's characterized by tissue loss and neurological dysfunction uh, due to cell cell death or damage. Um, and glial reactivity can, you know, have, have beneficial effects. It, it obviously has, you know, deleterious um, effects as well. And up until this point, few studies have examined how reactive astrocytes directly contribute uh, to synapse loss. Um, so the, the model that, 
that Dan uses, Dan's lab uses, is this controlled cortical impact or CCI um, paradigm where um, a hole is, is, is drilled into, into the skull and then a, a piston, um, a high pressure, a higher air pressure piston can then be uh, directed to, um, to the cortex and you can adjust um, you know, adjust the severity of, of the impact to look at more, either more moderate or more severe forms uh, of TBI. Um, but with their model, they, you know, they, they get, you know, tissue damage in cortex, but the hippocampus uh, remains intact. So you have synaptic damage um, in hippocampus in the absence of, of neuronal death. <clears throat> so what we found is that th these are um, these are sham animals. This is serine racemase. This is GFAP uh, for to label astrocytes, and this is IBA1 um, to label to label microglia. And you can see under you know sham conditions, you get very nice um, neuronal labeling without any um, glial uh, glial serine racemase. You know, and looking three days post injury, you really get this robust um, induction of of serine racemase in, in astrocytes uh, and microglia. Um, and this here was just a, a quantification of that. <clears throat> and you, you, know, you get this microglial SR expression coming on um, after three days and it goes up a little bit more after seven days, whereas um, serine, racemase, serine racemase in astrocytes, interestingly, takes a little bit of time to, to, to ramp up. Um, at three days, you have kind of this intermediate um, expression. And these here are just um, some more high power images showing um, showing the colocalization of, of serine racemase um, in astrocytes. So serine racemase is in magenta and the, and the GFAP is in green um, here. And then this is serine racemase in magenta and IBA1 um, in, the, in the cyan. And you can see it, you know, you can see this very nice um, <clears throat> expression of serine racemase in these glial cells following uh, TBI. Oops. Uh, and then also, uh, if you look at actual, um, you know, deserine levels, um, you can see that uh, deserine uh, goes up. Um, looking at hippocampus, you know, deserine goes up at seven days. Um, astrocyte knockout sham, no difference from wild type. But astrocyte knockout at seven days, you can see that knocking out serine racemase in astrocytes prevents the upregulation um, in deserine that you see in control animals. And this here is um, some deserine um, DAB uh, immunohistochemistry uh, looking at um, this is sham, um, <clears throat> and this is uh, seven days um, post injury. And you can see here, uh, deserine exp expressed in neurons. Similar to what we see with serine racemase, you actually get a re this reduction in, in serine racemase expression in the neurons when you're uh, closer to, to the site of impact. Um, and you see this reduction of uh, deserine in, in neurons as well. Um, and this here um, is in uh, Lancosa molecular, stratum radiatum. <clears throat> Under normal conditions, you know you don't see any uh, glial deserine, um, but uh, but following injury at seven days, you really see this robust uh, glial pattern uh, of deserine staining. So uh, so at this point, what we wanted to do was to see, you know, if if you can knock out. Um, serine racemase from these different glial populations, would you be able to, would that be neuroprotective um, at all? So, so it's one thing for them to produce it, but is it, is it actually doing something bad? So again, we, we went back to the strategy of using uh, these serine racemase flocks to animals <clears throat> and then crossing it with uh, different Crees. So this is a, a tamoxifen inducible uh, GFA uh, GFAP Cree, so you don't have to worry about any um, effects on neurons if, if this was a constitutively expressed uh, Cree. So this is a this is a control animal 
uh, seven days post injury. And you can see um, the intense white here, which is indicative of, of overlap of, of serum racemase in these astrocytes. Um, and then in the astrocyte knockout, you can see that you just only have GFAP expression. You don't have um, any serum racemase being expressed showing that you know it is, it is effective. And what we were doing was injecting the tamoxifen uh, about two weeks, two weeks prior uh, to the CCI to, to, to give, you know, to really make sure that serum racemase is, is fully eliminated is <clears throat> prior, you know, prior to, prior to the onset. So this is the um, in, in vivo um, LTP here. Um, and you can see in, in CA3, CA1, um, the black, uh, the black squares are the uh, control control animals that received injury. So you can see that you you get this nice deficit in LTP um, following the following TBI. The uh, blue squares are the astrocyte knockouts shams. So again, you don't see any change in LTP under baseline conditions, which is consistent with with, with all our other data, um, but. <clears throat> astrocyte knockouts that were injured in the red, you can see that they're no different um, from controls. So again, uh, demonstrating that the d serine being produced and released from these reactive astrocytes is detrimental uh, to plasticity. Uh, and this is looking at uh, fear conditioning. Um, so this is the contextual component, which, um, which is dependent on having intact, having an intact hippocampus. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> again, the uh, injured animals have, have this deficit in contextual conditioning um, that is um, that is prevented by having the injury. Um, and then if you actually give deserine to these astrocyte knockouts following injury, um, you actually make it worse. You bring them back, you, you uh, you, you again impair plasticity. So more recent data has, um, that Dan's lab has been looking at is, um, what about the TBI induced um, spine loss? So they, they were using some Golgi staining and looking specifically at ap apical dendrites of CA1 pyramidal neurons. So these are the control animals here. And by seven days, uh, post-injury, uh, you have the significant reduction in, in spine density in control animals. With the astrocyte SR knockout, it blocks that effect. And if you look at, so this is just total spine density. If you look at mushroom spines, which are thought to be the more mature, um, stable spines, <clears throat> you again get this uh, reduction, significant reduction following TBI um, that is again, uh, really blunted and prevented by uh, eliminating serine racemase um, from astrocytes. And conversely, if you're looking at thin spines, which could be, I mean, this is just a snapshot, you know, either immature or uh, degenerating um, spines, um, you, you can see you have an increase in those following TBI. And again, uh, the, the astrocyte SR knockout uh, is prevented. And then importantly, if you just look at the sham uh, control and sham astrocyte knockout, you don't see any changes um, in spine density under uh, normal um, you know, physiological conditions. So that is the enzyme serine racemase that you know, we, we've shown to be um, you know, important for mediating these bad effects of, of, of astroglial deserine. Um, but what about transporters? Um, so one, <clears throat> one of the transporters that's expressed in astrocytes that uh, our, our collaborator Herman Walsker has shown to be important for, for um, deserine uptake and release is the slick 1A4 or ASCT1 um, transporter. So Dan was able to get some, uh, some flocks, uh, slick 1A4 mice um, to get at, you know, what, what if you mess with 
uh, this astroglutal transporter? Do you, is, do you, would you get a similar effect as you would with the SR uh, conditional knockout? So these are uh, SLIC 184 flox animals uh, crossed with some laxy uh, mice to give you a, a, a reporter effect. And it, this is under sham conditions. This is three days post-injury, and this is seven days post-injury. And you can see you just get a massive um, upregulation of, of this slick 1A4 uh, following injury. <clears throat> and this is just looking at um, mRNA expression, um, again, post, uh, post-injury. And then there's this other uh, transporter, uh, slick 7A1, that kind of goes down at first, and then it um, and then it goes back up um, again. This is another transport that's impl that's implicated in deserine uh, transport and uptake and release. So, um, so they one they kind of got it went at this with two ways: one with um, pharmacology, another with um, genetics um, to block um, to block these inhibitors and and to see what what effect that has on various forms of uh, memory and, and plasticity following injury. Um, and long story short is it has a similar effect as um, as blocking uh, as blocking serine racemase. So if you block these transporters, again, you can prevent uh, the reductions in spine density. Um, this is seven days post injury, and very nicely they were able to go out to even twenty eight days. Uh, post injury, and, and again, you, you still see a deficit, a spine deficit post injury um, that that's prevented um, with the slick one A four um, inhibitor. And again, similar um, similar effects with um, with memory um, as well, being able to uh, block the memory impairments. Uh, post injury, both at, at, at seven days post injury, um, and then as well as uh, 28 days uh, post injury. So that, that's the astrocyte story. What about what about microglia? Um, so again, um, you know, using the SR flox animals, um, and then um, combining them with uh, the CX3 CR1. Uh, tamoxifen inducible uh, CRE. So again, you know, injecting two weeks uh, prior to injury, and you can see um, that you're able to. You're still getting astroglial. So this is the serine racemase staining. So you're still getting astroglial um, SR uh, induction, but you're not getting this microglial um, SR induction. So the the cyan is the is the IBA one. So here, um, again, you know, you, you're seeing the, the reductions in spine density, um, seven days post-injury uh, in the CA1 apical, um, apical dendrites. Um, and, and really very nicely, similar to what you see with the astrocyte SR knockout. Again, these animals, um, these animals are, are, are protected um, for reductions in spine density. And same thing with, um, for reductions in contextual uh, fear memory. So you can see here, this is the CX3CR1. Um, we also looked at um, using a different, um, a different Cree uh, animal to, to, really, uh, to really get at microglial um, SR. Um, the CX3CR1 Cree RT, you're targeting some other cells other than microglia, and then you're also uh, losing some endogenous uh, CX3 CR1 expression, which could um, make interpretation a little bit a little bit messier. So uh, we got in these team M one to one nine uh, Cree RT mice from Guoping uh, that Guoping Fang had generated and uh, deposited in Jackson. Um, so with these animals, it, it, it's a it's a transmembrane uh, receptor, um, but what's nice is that it retains the, you're not losing any endogenous TMEM um, function. Um, and, and this is a little bit more of a targeted uh, microglial um, CRE. Um, 
So this here is just, th th these are these are images, um, three days post injury in these team M um, Cree SR knockouts. And again, you can see very nice expression of serine racemase um, and astrocytes here, um, but no, no microglial um, expression. And this here is just the overlap of SR and GFAP. Um, so again, and again, even with, and with the team M, you're seeing a similar, um, you know, a similar effect as with the CX3 CR1. And then finally, um, this is a little bit something even more novel because there hasn't been <clears throat> much looked at with microglial um, DC urine transporters. Um, so they had um, used the slick 1A4 uh, floxed animals and then uh, knocked it out either in microglia or um, in astrocytes using these using these Cree animals. And what you see here is similar to what you see with knocking out serin racemase <clears throat> from astrocytes or microglia. Um, you see a similar um, protect, neuroprotective effect um, of eliminating this transporter from either astrocytes um, or microglia. Um, this is looking at uh, memory following re-exposure to uh, the context of, of fear conditioning. So there's really nice evidence, you know, implicating, you know, DC urine release from both, you know, the production and the release of, of DC urine from reactive glia um, is bad, <laughs> is bad for your brain. Uh, and then just in the last couple minutes, uh, talk about uh, some more recent work uh, from my lab looking at um, reactive astrocytes, deserine, and, and, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, everybody obviously knows Alzheimer's disease is really bad, is really bad. So, you know, millions of people living with it right now. Um, you know, by 2050, it's going to cost us about one trillion, you know, dollars, <laughs> you know, to, to, to treat and take care of people um, with AD. So you know, new, you know, new therapies are definitely needed quickly. So you, you don't have to worry too much about all, all of this text, but this is just, you know, showing that, you know, whether you're, you're you know, the familial AD, which is, you know, small percentage of, of the AD cases or um, late onset or load um, AD that's sporadic, that doesn't have a direct genetic uh, cause, you know, you end up you know, with microglial um, and astrocyte um, reactivity, a, a strong pathological uh, hallmarks uh, of the disease. You know, looking at human, you know, post postmortem tissue. You know, you you, you had these reactive astrocytes and reactive glia that are um, <clears throat> that are surrounding uh, these plaques, and 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 when they take on this reactive uh, profile, it really changes their um, really changes all aspects. Um, of their, you know, homeostatic uh, uh, functions. So, you know, when when we initially were looking at the TBI, you know, I wanted to look at, you know, other disorders where you had this neuroinflammation, and obviously Alzheimer's um, fits fits that bill. Um, so, looking at this uh, this accelerated medicine partnership in AD, um, they're having this for, for all, all, all all other disorders, a lot of other disorders now. Um, but you're know, looking at these large uh, public publicly publicly available um, data sets. We were looking at um, bulk uh, RNA seq data from these three um, three different um, post mortem co post mortem cohorts, um, and we can see. Um, in, in brain regions and temporal uh, temporal brain regions that are particularly hit hard in AD, you, you, you see this, um, you see these changes uh, in, in genes important uh, for the serine shuttle or you know deserine metabolism, and the changes and, and the gene expression changes that we see, you know, suggest that there's increased uh, deserine production and, and astrocytic um, deserine release, um, and and interestingly changes you see, uh, the brain regions where you see changes in, in serine shuttle genes 
are only in brain regions where you have um, kind of this gene expression profile that that's consistent with uh, reactive gliosis, uh, reactive astrocytes um, and reactive microglia. So these, these are just uh, genes that have been associated with um, reactive profiles in, in, in Alzheimer's disease. So this is some, this is some work we published a couple of years ago, uh, looking in human uh, post-mortem brain tissue, um, looking at serine racemase as well as uh, GFAP expression. And you really see this very robust increase, you know, 50 fold, you know, increases in the number of SR expressing um, astrocytes and, and it is BRAC, you know, more or less it's BRAC stage dependent. So the, the further along in the disease you go, the more uh, reactive astrocytes um, you have. So this is an entorhinal cortex, you know, obviously an area that gets hit real hard and early um, in Alzheimer's disease. And it's interesting, you know, you see these kind of layer dependent effects. So it's not homogenous throughout the brain regions. You definitely have areas um, that are more that are more highly uh, have this more reactive profile, and you know back in you know 2017, you know this paper you know came out from uh, late Ben Barris's lab talking about this A1 versus um, A2 astrocyte profile, and you know we were kind of using that C3 marker as as a you know way to to look at these kind of neurotoxic astrocytes. Um, but I mean, a recent uh, paper, you know, came out in Nature Neuroscience, you know, just talking about, you know, this binary uh, classification, you know, is obviously an over, over simp oversimplification of, of everything. Um, so, you know, you kind of need to look at a constellation uh, of factors to, to look at, you know, different states of the reactive, of, of these reactive astrocytes. Um, and then we also looked at, at, at hippocampus and again, look, you know, using C3 as kind of this, um, you know, marker of, of reactivity. And, and, and again, you can see here, oops, um, this really robust increase, this is in hippocampus, um, you know, where there's really nothing in, in, in age matched um, control, sub, control uh, cases, but this really robust increase um, in, in, in AD. And again, you can kind of see CA1 <clears throat> seems to be really high, highly affected um, and, and dente gyrus as well. The other subfields, not as much, not as robust. And then we collaborated with uh, David Weintracker's group at Emory who had this transgenic AD rat model um, to see if we can see the same thing in, in animals. And we do. Um, so we see this uh, robust increase in, in serine racemase and reactive astrocytes. <laughs> We use an HPLC and, and collaborating with Herman, you know, we, we had showed this increase in, in L serine um, in these AD rats, um, which is which would be consistent with, um, you know, increased uh, production of L serine and increased D serine production, um, increased glutamate um, in these reactive astrocytes as well. Um, and then when we looked at uh, some some proteins downstream of uh, some protein markers of uh, extrasynaptic NMDA receptor activation, you know, we, we see this uh, increase in um, increase in this uh, aptly named death associated protein kinase um, in, in these aged um, in these aged animals and increased uh, phosphogluin 2 b uh, this particular serine residue um, has, has been associated with uh, extrasynaptic um, gluen to be containing uh, receptors. Um, and then some more recent work was looking outside of hippocampus and entorhinal cortex and looking in some more in some more regions uh, lit, <clears throat> related to emotion and, and uh, emotional regulation. Um, and this is looking in, in the amygdala. Um, and you can see under control conditions, you don't, you know, you, you don't see any SR uh, <clears throat> serine racemase in in astrocytes, but in, in Alzheimer's disease, you see this robust increase in GFAP expression, robust um, C3 expression, and, and this really striking serine racemase expression um, as well in these reactive astrocytes. And this year is just a quantification. Um, and again, you know, it's not the same throughout the amygdala, 
um, there's certain, <clears throat> certain nuclei that are more effective than others. Um, and then uh, looking at a uh, uh, mouse, uh, mouse model um, of AD that we could get, uh, get ourselves, we were using this 5X fat, uh, fat mice, and then again, similar to uh, what we see um, in the human tissue, the young, uh, young FAD animals have, um, have neuronal SR expression, whereas the, um, the aged um, FAD animals ha have this uh, reactive uh, SR profile. Uh, and then we see the same, <clears throat> same thing in, um, in hippocampus. And then if we do the uh, D-serine immunohistochemistry, uh, this is an age match uh, wild type. Um, interestingly, you know, you, you do see a little bit, you know, uh, of serine race, uh, D serine in astrocytes, but it's really markedly increased in the uh, FAD animals. Um, and then that was SR, you know, that was serine racemase, but we're also interested, um, you know, in transport. So we we're looking at this um, slick one A five. So this is ASCT ASCT two. <laughs> Um, because that's that was one of the genes um, that popped up in multiple um, human RNA seq analyses as being very robustly upregulated um, in AD. Um, so using this, uh, we were able to to download this bulk, some raw data, some from this bulk RNA seq analysis from this AMP, <clears throat> from the AMP AD uh, website. Um, looking at 5X FAD animals at three, six, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in 18 months of age. And you see this very robust um, uh, increase, uh, age dependent increase in, in SLIC185 um, in these animals. <clears throat> and there's also a very significant um, positive correlation uh, with SLIC185 expression um, in GFAP <clears throat> and C3. Um, and then you see this similar uh, positive correlation uh, with GFAP and C3 in, in this particular um, human postmortem uh, RNA seq data set. So what our um, what our thought is is that uh, these reactive astrocytes um, in AD are, are you know producing SR. Uh, they're release, releasing you know D-serine potentially through this like 1A5, um, <clears throat> and then this D-serine is um, able to provide the coagonist for these extrasynaptic NMDA receptors to open um, because it, it's known that in AD, you kind of have this glutamate, excess glutamate and glutamate spillover um, that can then activate these extrasynaptic NMDA receptors. Um, but if you don't have the coagonist there, you know, the extracellular glut this excess glutamate can't do anything. So <clears throat> our hypothesis is that these uh, reactive astrocytes are producing the, the necessary D-serine to reach these extrasynaptic NMDA receptors um, that then triggers, um, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, transcriptional dys dysregulation, um, and eventually um, cell death. Um, and then finally, we, we just started um, working with this uh, company in South Korea um, called Peptron, um, and they have this sustained release formulation of exenatide, uh, which is used for type 2 diabetes. Um, and it's a glucagon one peptide receptor agonist. Um, and they've, they've had some really nice data in Parkinson's disease um, showing effic efficacy there um, in, in patients. So, and, and, you know, what we're thinking is this exenatide um, is, is preventing these microglia from, act from uh, converting these, these quiescent astrocytes into reactive astrocytes. So we're, we're testing this now to see um, in these 5X FAD mice, if, if this PT320 um, is neuroprotective in general um, in these FAD animals, but also if, if it prevents um, this upregulation of SR and reactive astrocytes. Um, so yeah, just to just to wrap up, um, you know, un, under normal conditions, SR and D-serine are enriched um, in neurons. Um, D-serine is released postsynaptically in a cell autonomous fashion. Um, reactive astrocytes and re reactive microglia um, express SR and D-serine and uh, following TBI, and it's bad. Um, and a similar phenomenon uh, is occurring um, in Alzheimer's disease, both in human tissue as well as uh, several different <clears throat> several different rodent models um, of AD. And just want to thank everybody from the lab, past current members, Dan, 
who's been, you know, been really great, uh, you know, working with him in his lab and uh, Herman at the Technion in Israel, Joe, my postdoc mentor, and everybody else, and uh, all the funding sources. So thanks. Thanks for clapping, Dan. <laughs> Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, the enzyme PHGDH is involved with glycolysis. So mm -hmm. drugging it causes much larger effects than just altering the serine levels. Um, is SRR involved with any other process or do the drugs specifically target uh, serine? Um, so, um, so I guess, so one thing is, is that, so I guess the, the PHGDH, you know, like pharmacological inhibitor that was, you know, that was put on, you know, I, I see what you're saying. Um, and that was, that was put on, um, the slices. Um, we haven't done any, um, pharmacological inhibition of serine racemase. Um, you know, we, we've only targeted, um, transporters implicated in, in, in uptake and release um, or doing kind of genetic elimination uh, of serine racemase. Um, people are trying to figure out ways to, you know, selectively modulate, you know, serine racemase is the type of enzyme it is. It's a little bit tricky. Um, and also, you know, neuronal SR is important. Um, you know, just for, just for regular NMDA receptor plasticity. So it would be, one would need to, you know, try to find a way to, let's say, target astroglial SR specifically and try and not affect neuronal. Um, as far like other effect, um, other enzymatic reactions, it, it does have one other, um, reaction that it, it, um, this alpha beta elimination of water that generates pyruvate, um, and ammonia. Um, but that seems to be somewhat of a less efficient reaction. It's, from what we know now, it seems to be mostly um, related to, um, you know, NMDA receptor function, but people are, you know, looking into other non-NMDA receptor effects as well. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering if it's possible to alter serine levels without like changing other metabolites. Oh, uh, uh, I think yeah, th that's also regulated by serine levels. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. It, it, I think it's kind of tricky because serine is 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 important, like you said, for a lot of different processes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think trying to get at serine level, uh, I think serine racemase, if you, I think is probably would probably the most proximal, you know, to deserine if if you wanted to try to manipulate it that way. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question maybe. Um, yeah. So it's kind of unique to have kind of a, a neurotransmitter such as DCRN potentially released from a postsynaptic um, spine or, or, or dendrite yeah. where it's glutamate released presynaptically for the most part. It would yeah. include the glial aspects of these. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you think these are differentially regulated through these different compartments? And is there actually a benefit um, for these this differential release and the activation of NMDA receptors? Yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot we don't there's a lot we don't know about, <laughs> about it. Cause it's, it, it, it is interesting that, you know, it is this kind of, it seems to be this autocrine, um, you know, mode of action, um, for, you know, for D-serine, it could be, it's a quick, you know, I don't know if it's a quicker way to, you know, get the coagulants there, you know, when you need it. Um, and, you know, with the, this was just looking at, you know, CA1, you know, dendrites. When we look at, at staining in other brain regions, you also see this dendritic, um, you know, localization uh, of serine racemase. So my guess is it's also in other, I, I think the mode of action, I think holds up, you know, across other brain regions as well. Um, 
And I think whether or not <clears throat> that, you know, this, this dendritic localization changes following injury, I think would be very interesting. Um, you know, cause I know we're focusing on the, you know, on the glial aspect of it, but, um, does the localization of SR change in neurons following injury that, which could, you know, exacerbate some of the deficits we're seeing? I guess just to follow up on that, is there any insight to how these would be selectively transported down dendrites um, ad adverse to axons and until there's just too premature for that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I, and, and yeah, then, I don't know if there's some, uh, there are, we, Timmy started looking at this and then we got <laughs> sidetracked with some other stuff, but looking at, you know, different um, splice variants and there are, there, there seems to be, um, there's somebody at Tufts who was doing some ribo trap on, um, you know, the being able to target uh, dendritic um, mRNAs and there was some, seemed to be some splice variants of SR that were enriched in dendrites. Um, so there could be, you know, targeting mechanisms that way. Um, that kind of get the mRNA out there, out to the dendrite for, you know, for local protein um, translation. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, we'd like to thank you, Derek, for, for a, a, a wonderful presentation. And um, we appreciate um, all this novel insight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Good seeing you.